In a make-or-break season for Ron Rivera with the Washington Commanders, Sam Howell takes over at quarterback. Well, what does this roster look like? Do they have a chance to compete in the NFC? We're breaking that down today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'd like to thank you for making Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every day. And of course, a big welcome to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Joe, happy Happy the Hornets get bamboozled again in the lottery. Not as bad as the Detroit Pistons got bamboozled. You know what? I, I just don't care. They've had recent number one pick. They got Cade Cunningham. My NBA fandom was almost back after the mm-hmm. NBA ripped my heart out when the Hornets had the worst record in the history of basketball, and they got MKG instead of Anthony Davis, and I felt like I relived it all again last night. I gave basketball a piece of me for 15 minutes, and guess what? They're not getting That's another it. piece of me for a long, long time. We can all agree we're Miami Heat fan, though, right? Go Heat. Who are they playing again? Oh, Celtics. Yeah, the Celtics. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. Heat. So go, go Heat. heat. Jimmy Don't Butler's about got that dog in him. Sitting here rooting for Jimmy. You know, I, I would say this about the Sixers. Choosing Tobias Harris over Jimmy Butler feels like a bad choice. Correct. Yeah. Just wait until him be- <laughs> Just wait until Embiid tries to get traded now from Philly and wants to go play with Jimmy in Miami. Send him, send him the Hornets. Send him the you Hornets. Want him, you Give want him? Something. I'll be a Hornets fan with you if Embiid goes down there. Come, come on, baby. All right. Come on. Our Hornets. He's You're not going locked there, on baby. NFL scouting. You're number uh, we're two talking, pick. You can have that, right? No. We're, we're, we're talking about the Washington Commanders today as we continue our film study. We did Caleb Williams yesterday, USC quarterback. I already got one uh, USC quarterbacks aren't good tweet uh, oh. to, to say that Caleb Williams is, is you shouldn't draft Caleb Williams. So oh, like Carson Palmer, happened. yeah, right. He said since Carson Palmer, all USC quarterbacks have been bad. So the, Caleb Williams is worth the hype. Yeah, that that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's an Oklahoma quarterback, right? <laughs> sure, sure. Joe Burrow, right? Oh, right, Joe, yeah, Joe Burrow, Ohio State quarterback. Well, Joe Burrow's an Ohio State quarterback, right? So, Let's take command of this podcast, Kyle. We're take talking about everything but the command. <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're still early. I mean, we're playing with house money as far as when we usually get into actually talking about uh, <laughs> the subject at hand. But uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, we do have the depth chart that we are going to walk through in segment three. But first, we're just going to talk about observations on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively. Joe, we ground the tape of Washington's team last year, Uh, watched several All-22 cuts uh, courtesy of NFL. What is it called now? Plus? Plus. NFL Plus? I'm still on Game Pass. So I don't have your fancy, what is that thing called again? A VPN? Yeah, that I don't have that. Yeah, I, I log in from London every time I get on, get on NFL.com. <laughs> you should switch it to Germany now, right? Can you do yeah, that? Yeah, I should switch it to Germany. You're right. But uh, we watched a bunch of all 22 of, of the commanders from last year with the objective being to put every player that we are anticipating being a significant contributor to this year's team into a bucket, whether those buckets are roster cornerstones, quality starters, adequate starters, rookies, replacement level players, quality depth pieces, incomplete evaluations, non-roster caliber players or practice squad developmental types. So those are the categorizations, the, what is that, nine? Draft these do math, nine different buckets that we can put players into. And we've put all except for three into buckets here with consensus already. So let's start on the offensive side of the ball and, and what we've seen from the commanders this past year. Obviously, a lot of turnover, new offensive coordinator and Eric Bieniemy quarterback change with second-year quarterback Sam Howell now projected to take over the starting reins. Uh, what'd you see? I, I like to talk about these wide receivers. That 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 was my big takeaway in studying this football team uh, offensively was Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. 
man, I love it. I, I love how these guys play. I love their route running. I love their uh, their ball con- their ball skills, their hands, their body control. Um, man, I think Dotson's going to be a real dude. Uh, it's a shame he missed some time in the middle there, but for him to be able to come in and showcase what he showcased um, in a situation where you know they played three different quarterbacks throughout the course of the season, none of them particularly good, and um, I think my goodness for Sam Howell next year to have these two dudes at his disposal is really, really exciting. Obviously Terry McLaurin, he's a highly paid receiver. We know exactly what he is, but with Jahan Dotson now with him, I, I love that duo. That's, that's the type of receiver tandem I'd like to have on any team. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's the movement skills, the route running ability, as you mentioned, the separation skills of both of those guys. I think the vertical, the ability to threaten you vertically too. Uh, you're watching Jahan Dotson, uh, he had one against San Francisco late in the year where Heineke was kind of late coming back to the other side of the field. And because he was late, he left it hung up there. But I mean, he, he had a 75, 80 yard touchdown waiting on him. If that ball had, had, if, if Hal had, or if Heineke had found him earlier. So you see these opera, the, these opportunities and these spurts of the ball production might not have been there as a rookie, but you're hoping as this offense maybe finds more efficiency with Eric B enemy. Um, Cause I think that was one thing that was really efficient. That, that offense was just very clunky. It felt like last Ooh, good year. Good word choice. Yeah. Clunky. Yeah. It's a good word choice. Yeah. I like that. You know, you, self-inflicted wounds, penalties, poor play up front, poor all the way play throughout up front. the season. Dude, I'm watching yeah. late season games. What are we doing? We can't get lined up. We, we we're having false starts left and right. Like this was embarrassing for a, you know, Scott Turner had been there for multiple years. Yeah, feast or famine in the run game, too. I thought thought some of their best work came on downhill gap principles, but they felt like they tried to run quite a bit uh, with zone concepts and, and try to get the edge. And Brian Robinson, I think, flashed quite a bit. I think he's a player I'm pretty enthusiastic about what he's going to be long term. But there's no secret what he was at his best right was between the tackles coming downhill and using that power and leg drive and punishing you uh, to, to fall forward and create extra yardage for your offense. The contrast for me between him and Antonio Gibson was pretty stark. Um, We're going to have to talk a little bit about classifying Antonio Gibson. He's a player. We didn't come to a consensus on when we did this separately and then compared notes, but um, Robinson, I think he, he he showed that what he showed from a growth perspective at Alabama as far as being more involved in all game situations and in passing downs wasn't a fluke. So I don't, especially now that they drafted Chris Rodriguez, what, in the fourth round, early on day three? Mm-hmm. It really feels like the Gibson squeeze is, is coming. Um, I want to talk about the offensive line a little bit, and then we should obviously get to Sam Howell. Um Can we- do we have to? We gotta we gotta acknowledge it. Um I, I thought on the left side there with Charles Leno and Andrew Norwell, I think they've showcased the baseline ability as starters. And and Charles Leno's a player that I really have gained an appreciation for for his longevity um and ability to be a serviceable left tackle. I don't think he's a plus starter, but he's sufficient. But dude, that right side, I mean, really center over was tough to watch. I know that they had uh a lot, you know, they played a ton of different centers, and I think that obviously didn't help. I mean, you had over 150 snaps from Tyler Larson, Wes Weitzer, Nick Martin, and Chase Rulier. That's tough to deal with. But then, like at right guard, dude, Trey Turner was a disaster. Their offensive line's going to be better because he's not back. And then even right tackle where, I mean, I think Cornelius Lucas had some sufficient moments, but I thought Cosme and Pass Pro really had some struggles there. I'm interested to see what he does now at guard. Uh, but from that center to right tackle, that was kind of tough sledding. And you know, there were just – I mean, especially watching him against the Giants in, in the front like that, man, the Giants' D-line just completely owned him, man. Played on, on the other side of the line of scrimmage. They couldn't get any movement whatsoever. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm i I'm glad that it's somewhat reworked with the arrival now of Nick Gates at center, with Cosmics kicking over to guard, with Andrew Wiley at right tackle. But I thought this was a pretty big problem, right, for, for this football team last year and for – your solution to that problem to be that, I'm a little underwhelmed. I would agree. Um, and I think from a financials perspective, 
there's still some transition that needs to happen. Roulier is a, a post-June 1 cut. He was on the books this year for $12.4 million. Yep. They'll save $8 million of that, and they'll, they'll, and they'll, they'll pay four of it next year. So they'll go four dead cap this year, save $8 million, but they'll take a dead cap hit of $4 million also in 2024. But Charles Leno's getting $26 and three-quarter million dollars over the next two seasons. I don't think he's trending the right way. Uh, I, I agree with you that the left side of the line was high floor, but I think both of those players are not trending in the right direction. I well. think Andrew Norwell's not the player he was at his peak either. Um, you mentioned bringing in Nick Gates, Andrew Wiley uh, at right tackle. I think that's actually a pretty strong contract, the way that that breaks down. It's, it's about... $24 million over the next three seasons, so $8 million per year. Uh, you look elsewhere on this offensive side of the ball, too. I mean, Curtis Samuels do $13 million this year to be the third option in the passing game. Logan Thomas is due $8.5 million this year and over $8 million next year. Can we talk about the tight end room? You know, you, you we have the same thoughts about the offensive side of the uh, offensive line. Is there... John Bates is your appealing sell in the tight end room as a blocking, non-receiving threat player. I mean, Logan Thomas on the books the next two years for $8.5 million is, is nuts. Kyle, this team had the most expensive offense in football last year. The most expensive offense in football was the Washington Commanders. And... I mean, obviously, it was pretty disappointing. I so the distribution of of contracts here is, is kind of tough to reconcile. That that that's for sure. Um, but also, like, I think this team offensively, like I said, the I'm underwhelmed with how they address their offensive line. But I think their other biggest problem, or their biggest problem, was quarterback play. What they got from Carson Wentz and Taylor Heineke, and we got one game of Sam Howell, and their answer there was to just roll with Sam Howell and bring in Jacoby Brissett. Like, I have questions about that. Being yeah, I, I have more path. questions than answers, and I think that's – I'll pull up the, the depth chart here. There, there's more pink on the orange side of the ball, but there's pink in some pretty key spots. And, you know, we're, we're obviously enthusiastic about the forecast for Jahan Dotson and Brian Robinson. But Sam Cosme, as a player up front, needs to be good. I think they need John Bates to be good because Logan Thomas is still getting paid off that one year where he had like 600 receiving yards. And we have no clue what Sam Howell is. Yeah. There, there's a narrative around Sam Howell based off the Week 18 game. But how much faith I can put actively in that to be who he's actually going to be, is it, it's a very, very, very small sample size. I think the range of outcomes for him specifically is enormous. Yeah. I didn't learn enough about Sam Howell in week 18 to say, you know what? That's my guy. That's my starter. Now, obviously they spent a year with him, right? With throughout the entire off season and throughout the year, they, they got a feel for who Sam Howell is. But it, if you're pointing to week 18 as you're okay, this is our guy. I, I have questions about that. I know he, his first pass was a touchdown uh, and that gets people excited and a couple of, of uh, nine routes where he, you know, hit a receiver in stride. But for the most part, I don't know. I take a whole lot. I take away a whole lot more from the red zone interception that he threw and, you know, the fact that there was a point in that game where it felt like he just knew not to to mess it up and just ran with the football and he showcased some things there. But I, I don't know. Like, did, does this look like a guy that deserved to be the starter going Uncon into the season? Yeah, which is Jacoby uncontested. Like, right. I mean, and Jacoby's been a, a spot starter the last few years, but the body of work's been – it was good in Cleveland – it was awful in Miami, and you acknowledge that the offensive staff in Miami was horrendous, and his style clashed dramatically versus the the starter that was supposed to be there. But I would also say his style clashes dramatically with the style of the player he's designed to be backing up now in the first year of a system. All right, pound well, the rock. I think that's that's yeah. that's their their pathway to success is to pound the rock. Case yeah, in point, they, they drafted to. a running back after they drafted Brian Robinson on day two last year. Yeah. I thought that was what they were at their best, was running downhill at teams and give yourself a chance to get some movement up front, even though when you're playing in the NFC East and you got to play Jordan Giants, Davis. Eagles. 
Dexter Lawrence. Jay, Jalen Carter, Dexter Lawrence, Leonard Williams. Dallas with Mozzie Smith now and Jonathan Hankins. Good luck moving inside. Because I don't think you got the right kinds of bodies at this point. As you, case in point with you mentioned, Nick Gates being your answer there and a tackle build in Sam Cosme now playing the other guard spot with Norwell, who uh, I think we, we both agree is an adequate level starter right now, but not the player that his reputation had once indicated that he was as a quality starter in the NFL. All right, we're going to shift our attention to the Washington Commanders defense here in just a moment, but first we need to tell you about Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the planet. Kyle, I uh, hold it up just before we say started, the line, I, Bart. Uh, I had the Animal Cookie Bar. Big fan of this one. It's uh, phenomenal. Yeah. And and they just announced the uh, the Red Velvet Puffs. I have three boxes of those coming my way. Three, uh, dude. Yeah, the Red Velvet. Hey, me, 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 and Red Velvet are friends. Yes. Did you ever decide if you were to take that Built Bar bet that we had discussed? I don't remember what it was. Well, all right. We'll we'll circle back to it. Go we'll ahead and tell, tell the fine it. folks about Built.com, Walmart, Sam's Club, and the whole Well, yeah, the they're healthy. Farm. They're delicious, right? They're delicious. I just mentioned the amazing flavors that they come in. They're covered in 100% real chocolate. It's like eating a candy bar, but they're good for you. And they're low calorie. They're low sugar. They're high in protein. 17 grams of protein, 140 calories, only 5 grams of sugar in this Built Bar. Check them out. Go to Built.com. Order yourself a box or three. And uh, use our promo code LOCKDOWN15. It'll get you 15% off your next order. But you can also go to Walmart or Sam's Club. Pick up a box off the shelf. Try them, folks. You'll thank us later. I don't remember what it was either. Oh, good. I remember it was something, <laughs> something that I liked it. I was hoping you would take it. No, you you said, give me till tomorrow. Remember? Wow. It was an off-the-air conversation that we had. And you said, give me till tomorrow at the end of the show. And then we never followed remember. up on it. Do not remember it. We'll, we'll, <clears throat> we'll spend time in, in empty thought. We'll burn a lot to... of daylight trying to remember what that was. Okay, look, commanders defensively. Uh, their reputation is forged up front, and rightfully so, with Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne and Montez Sweat as a former first-round pick and, and Chase Young as a player who we're hoping to see back to what he was capable of being when he was early in his career. Uh, I think we would both agree that the the decision not to exercise the fifth-year option was probably the right decision based off the information that we have right now, especially when you consider what else they are paying players up front. Um, some interesting depth players, Obata, John Ridgway they brought in as a... He flashed a little bit late in the year. Yeah, yeah. I think pad level, was, which was a concern at Arkansas, is still a, an inconsistent issue, and... He'll have to get better there, but certainly don't think he deserved the fate he got in Dallas where he was cut partway through his rookie season when they, they picked him. Uh, Phi Mathis, James Smith-Williams, I think, is has been a rotational player who's gotten a lot of run because of the Chase Young issues, and I, I think that's a player that you have a hard time being mad about being a part of your edge rotation. I, think, I actually think both their backup players in Obata and and Smith Williams are are pretty sturdy backup players. The problem is just with the Chase Young stuff, you're getting a lot more run than those guys probably ideally would. Obviously, a big year for Chase Young. I mean, watching him late in the season was kind of tough. Um, just didn't feel like he had a lot of juice. And so, hopefully, another off season further removed from the injury, we can see Chase Young get back to what we saw as a rookie. But we have two years of a whole lot of nothing uh, from Chase Young. So, big year for him. Uh, something I was really encouraged uh, about was Jamin Davis. I thought he took some major strides throughout the course of the season, um, especially, you know, kind of that back half into the close of the year. I thought he, he played some pretty good football and um, I think he'll be better. Uh, I we'll, we'll talk about Cody Barton later on. I, I mean, I thought John Bostic was a total mess. Um, just you every watch the Giants game. You watched the Giants game. Yeah, I watched. Yeah. How so, about that open field brother <laughs> when they ran where they were in 2021? The guy or, couldn't get an angle on anything. His yeah, pursuit it, leverage was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Can't play can't play in space, can't cover. Uh, so it'll be better for him not being out there, but I think you know a sta more stable player next to Jamin Davis could, could even help him take another step, and you certainly love him getting a chance to play behind Allen and Payne uh, at defensive tackle. Kyle, I thought this safety tandem was pretty intriguing. I know that they have to kind of continue to gel and grow together, but Derek Forrest and Cameron Curl, I think, has the potential to be a really solid group as they – 
mature together in the league and, you know, I, I, looking for a little bit more splash plays out of them. But I think that's a, an appealing young young safety duo. Yeah, I actually thought their, um, their safety nickel play last year aside of Danny Johnson was, was pretty good as far as you saw some nice – late cuts of routes that are deep crossers on extended plays and really driving on throws. I thought Bobby McCain, who not under contract right now, but had some good flashes tackling on the perimeter where you're hoping that Quan Martin can step into that role as a player. Who's more of a viable um, man coverage option at this stage in McCain's career versus Quan Martin and feel like you get an upgrade in coverage, but the same kind of tackling presence that McCain gave you at times uh, particularly when it was in short spaces near the line of scrimmage. I know Bobby you know, missed tackles in space in deeper portions of the field has kind of been the bugaboo for him throughout the last couple of years. Uh, you got a couple really good special teams players in, in depth in those rooms too, between Reeves and uh, Percy Butler, who I think give you some nice versatility. I think it was pretty telling that Washington spent a lot of time with very few linebackers on the field, and maybe that was because David Mayo was getting run and you didn't need to watch too many reps of David Mayo say, okay, yeah, we, sh- we should probably go <laughs> go find somebody with a some little bit more dynamic athleticism uh, to play out here and try and get involved in the run fits. But um, I like the safety room for what it is. It's just a young group of players that still have to declare themselves more to determine how high their ceilings are and specifically how high their floors are. Just kind of looking at these corners as well. um, I felt like Kendall Fuller was supposed to be worse than what I watched. I felt like he's a guy that took some criticism on social media. I thought he played pretty well in the games that that I watched as well. And I think, you know, he's a guy that has some inside outside appeal um, you know, first round pick in Emmanuel Forbes. We'll see how that comes together. Benjamin St. Juice has been somewhat flashy. Um, they got options here. Cam Dantzler coming over from Minnesota. That's really kind of interesting because I thought he was trending towards being a, a starter for the Vikings, and they they moved on kind of kind of suddenly, right? And you know, maybe he could be a factor here. But I think they have enough options here, both outside and the slot, to kind of sort this out. They got to figure out the right mix. But you know, hopefully their DB play. Um, can improve collectively. I think in individual moments, they had their moments. Like even Danny Johnson, I thought had his moments, but I think being more cohesive with, with how they space the field and, and, and cover, I think is where, where they need to show growth. And I think their edge rush kind of coming back will be important and all that, that really materializing. Plus see if they can get better coverage from their, their, their middle backer and Cody Barton. Can, can we acknowledge too, that Kendall Fuller, is probably still best served to to play in the slot. And he took 950 snaps out wide as an outside corner last year. But what do you do what do you do there when I mean you just drafted Quan Martin in the second round, right? You have Danny Johnson who's a, a hedge there like do you what do you do uh, with Danny Kendall Johnson's Ford? not stopping me from no, doing he's, anything he's based not. off the games I watched lately. He's not, but he's at least depth. He's at least reasonable depth yeah. at the spot. So, like, if you're trying to well, put your best three corners on the field, what's your plan to do? Yeah, he's probably he's probably going to play outside. But if we're acknowledging what the reputation of Kendall Fuller is and trying to cross-reference it well with, well, where would Kendall Fuller ideally in a vacuum play, it's probably yeah. not the spot they had him play last year. Right, and I don't think it's going to be the spot they're going to have him play this year. There's a reason this dude played 2,000 snaps in the slot his first four years in the league. Because it's where he's best suited to play. And now the last two seasons, he's played 1,600 snaps out wide. So, yeah. You're making a nickel, ideally a nickel corner. You're playing him on the outside, and he's your best corner based off of what the proven commodities are on the roster. You're hoping Emmanuel Forbes will be a player who's a viable outside corner can step in right away. Obviously, there are some questions there with his size and stature. St. Just has been up and down. You have all of these, and look, maybe they're gonna, maybe Del Rio's gonna want to continue to run these one linebacker <laughs> nickel looks with a safety on the second level, like they're doing down on the four yard line against the Giants in the second game that they played against the Giants last year. And Danny Johnson's mind melted because they ran Wildcat and didn't know how to fit 
fit the gap, and he pedaled into the end zone, and Saquon ran into the end zone. Another situation, just like we talked about some of the concerns they had on offense and how they chose to address it, defensively, I come away pretty pretty much in the same spot where, I don't know, your edge rush, you're, you're hoping that Chase Young can find himself. Bostic was a mess, so you bring in Cody Barton. Your DBs needed to be better, and so you took a 166-pound corner in the first round and Quan Martin in the second round. I don't know. Like I just, I have a lot of questions about this offseason and if they really did the best they could to address some of these problems on the roster. Okay. So let's come to consensus on the commanders here in close. I think that's – anything else you want to exhaust defensively? No. Okay. Let's come to consensus here. So we have the depth chart up. Joe, we have uh, roster cornerstones available at Terry McLaurin and Jonathan Allen right now. We have quality starter, Deron Payne. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. So there is so much pink on this depth chart for players who are young, you know, in new situations. Players like Cam Dancer, who you mentioned. Players who are young, like Derek Forrest. Benjamin St. Juice, Chase Young with the injury issues, Phi Mathis in his second year, John Widgeway in his second year, Sam Cosme kicking inside full-time to guard, second-year players in Brian Robinson, Sam Howell, Jahan Dotson. It's just a lot that's in flux. The Commanders are going to be a team based on the performance of those players that are in pink that we just mentioned. The performance of them is going to create what the outcome of the year is going to be, and the variance is massive. But we largely saw a lot of this unit exactly the same. We only had three players of note, Antonio Gibson, Curtis Samuel, and Cody Barton, uh, that we did not come to consensus on. Can I ask you the same question with Jahan Dotson that I asked you about George Pickens? Sure. As a pink player, because not all pinks are created no. equally. No, they're not. If you were bucketing Jahan Dotson, and you couldn't use incomplete evaluation as the bucket that you put him in. <laughs> He's going in quality starter, right? Yeah, he absolutely is. Yes. I, just, I, I thought it was an inappropriate thing to do after like 60 targets as a rookie. Right. You know what I mean? Like He was awesome. I don't really have any questions about him. But I, so, I just don't know that I could have said anything more definitive on him just given, like I mentioned, what do you have, like 60 targets last year. Right. So that that's important context here when when we grade out this roster is, is all of these pinks – as they play throughout this season, they will declare themselves and, and Washington could dramatically vault up or they may potentially sink further from where they're, they end up ranking when we do the full roster rankings. But uh, we have three players to come to consensus to Curtis Samuel, wide receiver, Antonio Gibson, running back and Cody Bart linebacker. Where would you like to start? Uh, let's start with Curtis Samuel. Sure. Let's start with Curtis Samuel. I have him as an adequate starting slot receiver. And I have him as a quality depth option is what I bucketed him in. So obviously he played a lot more snaps after a quiet year in 2021, dealt with injuries, kind of had the whole year blown up, played 850 snaps offensively. Um, looked like he could still run, which is good. I guess I, I kind of got thrown with what they tried to do with him to just facilitate touches for him. And some of this is probably beyond his control, but I didn't think those schemed opportunities went particularly well. And I was really turned off by how poorly efficient he was with all of the touches that he got. Yeah, I think I think that's what they leaned into. I, I don't know. I've watched Scott Turner's been with Curtis Samuel, I think, his entire career. And um I feel like they've always kind of want to manufacture things to him where I, I think traditionally like he can just play receiver and, and um and the slot in particular. And so I, I think he's a multifaceted player that you can use in a variety of ways. And like if you're if you're if you're looking at him through the lens of, okay, this is a top two option in our passing game, then I don't think that he's a sufficient player there. But if you tell me as a slot player 
and a guy that can be used with some horizontal jet sweep spacing type stuff that does have some speed and, and appeal with the ball on his hands. I'd like that for him. If you think that means he's more quality depth, then I, I understand your angle as well. But if you tell me I look at him through the lens of a slot receiver, I think he's a sufficient starter. Okay. And I tend to fall more in line with that first part where if you're facilitating touches, if he's your jet sweep player, guy you'll you'll put in the backfield and try and get some, I don't want to say cheap touches too, but design touches. Um, I didn't think the efficiency particularly warranted that type of role at this point. Now, to be fair to him, his average depth of target was 6.9 yards downfield. But I was also a little alarmed that 50% of his targets, Joe, came in the first five weeks of the year. Hey, phase phase out a little bit. So. We have to come to consensus here, right? We, we do, yeah. This, is, this feels like one of the more. Well, you know, he started, I'll tell you this. He started as purple for me, and then I switched him to, to yellow, and, I, and that's because I chose to switch the lens. If, if we take this, okay, I think this is where we where we might have to settle on this, is you have to do it in a vacuum. I think his ideal role is more aligned with the quality depth role, what you're talking about. For this team, I think they view him as their starting slot receiver and in, in a, in a sufficient one in that. And that makes him an adequate starter in the slot. For them, but if you want to look at it in a vacuum, I think he's quality depth. Okay, so what to keep congruency with what we've done in these in the past. Do you recall how we have applied that in the past? Just because I feel I like we've be... leaned, we've leaned more into what, how the team views them. Okay. So then we'll put him as an adequate starter because it's the role within the team and the team's expectations and the team's decision-making process. Okay. Antonio Gibson's next. I'm going to be honest. I did not like him. The more yeah, I watched, I the asked. more I the more I understood why the team felt the way that they did last year. When everybody was like, "Well, I can't believe Antonio Gibson's his versatile running back." Because fantasy football, right? That's all it is. Fantasy football. The vision was bad. The consistency in in the reads, I did not think was good. I know ball security's kind of been a thing there in the past. He's an intriguing player because of what he can do in the passing game. But as a running back, I think he's a replacement level player. So I have him as quality depth and you have him as replacement level. Yes. I, I, I gave him a quality depth designation because of the, of the pass catching upside and what he's proven in that capacity. Right. I think that's a redeeming quality that makes him a, a reasonable top three back. I'm not, I'm not feeding him the football, you know, running it a ton. Um, but I think there's there's a role that he can play that, that has some value. So can that's... I can I ask you this though? If mm-hmm. we're acknowledging that Curtis Samuel is a schemed touch kind of chess piece movable player within the offense as well, and then we cross reference that with the team drafting running backs in the first four rounds in each of the last two drafts. Does having another player that you can move around reduce the value of what his redeeming quality is and then put more focus back on him actually being a running back? Maybe so, but I mean, I think that was a lot of how Scott Turner wanted to play offense. And I think about Eric Bieniemy, and we think about the Chiefs, like they've, they've kind of been able to use backs in that way. I think he's going to catch. I mean, I bet he catches 40 or 50 passes this year. I'm not sure if that moves the needle. I mean, he'll be a contract year for him. He's 24 years old. I guess he's very soon to turn 25. I think they're wanting to get ahead of it a little bit. So leaning into the draft depth. picks. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight this real hard. You know, quality right. depth. That's where I think is appropriate. Okay. Uh, Cody Barton. Last one. It seems like you have some thoughts on Cody Barton. I just, I think I have thoughts on Cody Barton because I watched how badly this team needed a Mike linebacker. 
And this was their answer. A guy that was a, a backup player for three years, starred in what, and was okay for Seattle last year. Like, yeah, there was an okay player. He got a lot better down the stretch though. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say that the first month of the season versus the back two months of the season for Cody Barton was a tale of two different players. And so now we're putting him into a new situation where he needs to be, you know, the green dot player for this football team. I just have him as in, incomplete, right? I, you have him as a quality, an adequate starter. Adequate me, starter, say, yes. Yeah. And I just yep. have him incomplete because he's got one year as a starter, and now he's in a new situation. I think they gave him like one year, three and a half million to come over. So and either, either I, I guess where I drew kind of a hard line in the sand in my mind for Barton as an incomplete evaluation is he's a fifth year player, and I understand he didn't. He played what four hundred snaps his first three seasons, so I understand like not a big working volume. But it just felt like as five years, coming into your fifth year, I felt like, man, like, do I really want to take the low-hanging fruit here and just say, oh, well, we don't know. I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I don't blame you because it crossed my <laughs> mind too. But then I'm like, ah. It feels like he's far enough in, and then he he really progressed well last year in, in that Seattle defense for me to kind of want to buy in a little bit. All right, let me tell you why. I'm going to meet you on this one. And the reason why is because I'll I'll – I'll buy into the growth last season and I'll buy into him playing behind what I think is a good defensive tackle situation in Allen and Payne. Now, now Deron Payne has to remember it's not a contract year anymore and he can also play the run and not just sell out and rush the passer all the time. But if he gets kind of back to to being a a more fundamental player, minor details. (laughs) So there's the commanders. There's 11 and a half sacks because he's, he stopped playing the run, but I respect it. He got a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> got himself a, a deal. Um, it's a good player. This is probably the most fascinating group that we've done so far. Because as you said, we're not saying it's all bad, but we are saying we have questions. And we don't have answers yet. And this is a very high leverage year with new ownership coming in. And several years of kind of being stuck in neutral from a wins and losses perspective. This team has to make a jump. And the rest of the East is highly competitive. Well, case in point, Washington was competitive last year. They won eight games. But I think you you have to you have to take a definitive step forward, and you're banking on a lot of incompletes to do that for you. And I think that's kind of why we have the questions we do about the commanders. Incompletes in big spots. So that's, this was the only team in that division that didn't make the playoffs last year. Right. That's it's the tough. Commanders. Yeah. Tomorrow's the Falcons. Yeah. Hey, you know what's really fun about that? Hmm. Is that I have at least some level of belief based on some Twitter interaction that I had is that people are, like, doing this with us. Oh, I hope they are. Dude, that is so cool to me. Like, we're doing the Falcons tomorrow. So if you spend time right now watching the Falcons and, like, come in with your own thoughts and, like, want to, like – see where we land on stuff and then like let's talk about it in the YouTube comments. That would be so cool. So Falcons Please. tomorrow if you want to if you want to join us. Scout the Falcons. Uh pro tip, put Bijan Robinson in green, but if you put him in navy blue as a roster <laughs> cornerstone, I wouldn't be mad at you for doing it. Um hit subscribe. You know, whether you find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, we hope you guys are enjoying this series. Uh Commanders t- today, Falcons tomorrow, 2022 starting quarterbacks from that draft class on Friday. So you got lots to look forward to. Hit subscribe. Keep it locked in right here on Locked on NFL Scouting with Kyle Krabs, Joe Marino. We are out of here. Make it a great rest of your day. Talk to you tomorrow. Talk about the Falcons.